The next two topics are a bit tricky to put in order. They're inextricably tied to each other. They're essentially the same topic. So in introducing them, one has to dance around a little bit. So what I'm going to do is talk about the geometry that underlies all of space-time, or the ether, the vacuum. I'm going to talk about why it exists, and how it exists, and from there I'm going to go into the dynamics of motion, which are based upon that lattice work. So it might be necessary to watch one, and then the other, and maybe juggle between the two to get a really good understanding. And again, trying to be brief. If you go to the Sims videos, you can get a much more detailed description with slides of how all of this works. The videos I'm putting on here are simply to pique the curiosity and give a good outline of the theory. There have been several physicists, scientists, who have talked about the necessity for there to be a grid underlying nature as we know it in order for nature to exist the way we observe it. Dr. Robert Moon is a notable example, Walter Russell, and there are many others. Why is that necessary? Dr. Moon approached the subject through the geometry of atomic structure. Atoms always reflect geometries in their movements, specific geometries. In fact, 84% of the material that makes up the universe generates atomic probability clouds reflecting the platonic solids. So the electron path of an atom is always drawing very specific geometry. 84% uh, of the matter in our universe can be drawn, or is drawing, uh, this very simple three-dimensional shapes of the platonic solids. So if everything was just spinning randomly out there, it would make all kinds of random shapes, all kinds of random blobs, uh, random bits, and all kinds of random stuff. We would see no patterns at all. The universe could not exist as we see it. When we look out there, we see some very distinct patterns, and those Patterns always seem to work in a very set order. When we look at galaxies, the galaxies adhere a bit loosely because there are a lot of elements that can affect them at that scale, but they adhere to a set of principles in their motion. And these geometries are also reflected in the organization of galaxies in superclusters, so getting bigger and bigger. Similarly, atoms behave in a very distinct way. Every atom of a particular element always behaves the same as all the other atoms in that element. So it seems kind of obvious, but we'll put it on the table, because for the entire universe to be doing that randomly is clearly out of the question. There's definitely some kind of structure going on here. Similarly in chemistry, there are always very geometric bondings between atoms in molecules, and also in compounds. You see examples of this all over the place. Salt always forms a cube, sapphire, tetrahedron, etc., etc. And if given a perfect growing environment, they'll make fractal growth patterns based upon their original geometry. So why the geometry? Why does it work that way? Dr. Moon and Dr. Russell, a little background on these guys. Robert Moon was a professor of physical chemistry at the University of Chicago. He was instrumental in the Manhattan Project. Uh, Walter Russell, through his theoretical physical model, theorized four elements that were unknown, and more than a decade later, they were all discovered, one of which was plutonium. Uh, these physicists, and many others, spoke of a grid that must be intrinsic to space-time itself, a grid that all of nature conforms to at every scalar dimension. So what would this grid look like? In Haramain's model, there are several rules the grid must adhere to to make sense based upon what we observe. It has to be symmetrical, because everything we've ever seen in the universe is spinning, and spin itself generates symmetry. So clearly, everything's spinning, everything has symmetry, so the geometry it's based upon must also be symmetrical. Number two, it must have a very stable equilibrium. That is to say, no amount of pushing on it from any direction would distort it. For example, if you have a hollow cube and you push on the corners, it flexes. There's all sorts of distortion possible in that shape. Not stable equilibrium. It would have to be a shape for which no distortion was possible. 
as when we look up through space, we see nothing at all. In order for us to look through something and see nothing, it has to be absolutely, perfectly crystalline in structure. Flawless. And because the vacuum is not just disturbed all the time, and thank goodness, it would be like explosions all the time and life would be impossible, it must have a very stable equilibrium. We observe that. And then the third element, it must be fractal in nature. It has to be a shape that can replicate and essentially have the same geometry at all different scales. Because we see the same energy dynamics happening at different scales. And that could only happen in a grid with fractal growth. So what shape does all of those things? Well, after 20 years of research and thought, the shape Haramein came up with is called a 64 tetrahedron grid. It obeys all these different laws. It has spin symmetry, fractally builds upon itself, and has a very high degree of equilibrium. Very, very stable. It has such high stability because it's based upon a cuboctahedron. Buckminster Fuller calls a cuboctahedron the vector equilibrium. Uh, Fuller said that it was the most stable three-dimensional shape possible. You can't push it or pull it out of shape in any direction. Every vector is the same length. If you look at it from the outside, it looks like eight tetrahedrons pointed in toward each other, and between those tetrahedrons are cavities, which are pyramidal. If you can imagine star tetrahedrons now, that's two tetrahedrons pushed through each other, so they make a 3D Star of David, if you will. If you took eight star tetrahedrons and placed them together in the only fashion that they'll fit point to point, the tetrahedrons pointing inward, the little bits of the star tetrahedrons pointing inward, will form a cube octahedron in the middle. And then, if you connected the outermost points of the eight star tetrahedrons, you get a second octave of the original cube octahedral shape. So cube octahedron, cube octahedron. And then if you add more tetrahedrons to the outside for the next fractal level, you get 512 tetrahedrons now, and you get another octave of the cube octahedron, etc., 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 all the way out to infinity and all the way in to infinity. So there's our fractal development. Now, this geometry is doing all the things we see in the universe in our observation. And there's incredible proof for this, and it lies all around us. It's kind of unavoidable once you start getting into it. A stunning example can be found in our solar system, every planet, as well as our home star. If you spin the shape I was just talking about, the points will scribe two lines on the outside of a sphere. Those lines will be precisely 19.47 degrees north and south latitude. So that's an extremely important number. Let's start with the sun. The highest concentration of sunspot activity, precisely 19.5 degrees north and south latitude. And all kinds of energetic phenomenon on all the planets match this phenomenon in a way that would be totally eerie if it weren't for Haramain's theory, which predicts this. The blue spot on Neptune 1900, or excuse me, 1200 mile per hour winds sustained for as long as we've been able to image Neptune and lies at exactly this latitude. The red spot on Jupiter, identical latitude. It's been there for at least 300 years that we've been able to image it. Next door, we've got Saturn. When we fly over the North Pole, we see a huge hexagon with a vortex leading downward. This like, anomaly seems to turn conventional physics on its ear. Haramain's model predicts this. If you look down on a 64 tetrahedron grid, that's exactly the shape that you see. Moving on to Mars, the largest volcano in our solar system, Olympus Mons, also exactly the same latitude. And here back home on Earth, the largest energetic anomaly on our planet, the Hawaiian Islands, lie at exactly 19.47 degrees. Regardless of how the plates move across the globe, the hot spot always stays at 19.47 degrees. And, you know, geophysics is at a, a loss to explain how that works. Haramain's model explains it. Also, the largest incidence of hurricane and typhoon formation, 
also 19.47 degrees. So on Hera Main's videos, there are excellent slides on all of this material and many, many more examples and supporting evidence. So check them out to learn more. There are four or five more videos to come in this series.